If you want to see your name at the beginning of all of our videos, as well as see exclusive content here on the homestead, please feel free to join our Patreon. Memberships start off at just a dollar a month. And as always, thank you for your support. So there are quite a few options for aggressive does towards bucks. Of course, you named the very first option if you just don't want to deal with it, and that is to cull out the rabbit which is completely valid. Sometimes aggressive does just aren't worth their feed. Now, the other option is you can table breed. And I always get somebody upset about table breeding in the comments when I mention it. Sometimes does are just too aggressive and will either hurt or kill a buck they don't want to breed with. And in a rabbit breeding program that is focused on sustainability and meat, an aggressive doe who won't have babies is not sustainable. But I digress. With table breeding, you basically are there as the mediator to either hold the doe so her face doesn't get near the buck, or to put the buck in the best position possible to allow the breeding to happen. A great example of this is Lizifer. Lizifer does not like being bred, period. But just like every doe on the property, she has three chances to catch a breeding. But if she continues to be aggressive and continues to be a problem, then I will not keep her and I will eat her. Another option for your doe is to see if maybe switching out your buck helps. Some does do not like a certain buck, but they'll breed for other bucks. Sadie is a magnificent example of this. Um, she does not like Gigi. She will not breed with Gigi. She's not necessarily aggressive, but she will not lift for him. She does not like him. But she will lift for Strawberry, and she really likes Strawberry. So if I'm looking for something a little less dramatic and a little less work, I'll just throw her in with Strawberry. And all of these suggestions are on top of the idea of making sure your dough is ready. If you look at her vent, is it the appropriate color? You want a dark reddish purple. Is she at the appropriate weight? Is she mature and of breeding age? And if you have tried breeding her before and you have answered all of these questions in a positive manner, have you tried other tricks? Taking her for a car ride, apple cider vinegar in the water, 12 to 18 hours of daylight, swapping the buck and doe's cages overnight. These are all of the boxes that I check before I necessarily look at culling a doe for breeding aggression. But best of luck to you with this doe in the future. So this is a great question, but gosh darn, you're going to make me do some freaking math. Because it varies. Because my numbers in the winter are so different from my numbers in the summer. So we're going to have to do math. So you want to feed your rabbits about one ounce per pound of body weight. Or if you have grow outs, you want to feed them one ounce per pound of body weight that you want them to be. So for instance, my large rabbits that are about 10 pounds get two cups a day. My smaller rabbits get about a cup a day. And all of those feedings are cut into two feedings a day. So I would want to take my animals, see how many I have, see how much they weigh, take my feed by ounces, divide it by pounds, and see how fast I go through a 50-pound bag. I would do the math on here in front of you, but I would embarrass myself, so I'm just going to cut to the chase of what I found. Right now, with my 25 adult rabbits, I am going through about a bag and a half to two bags in a week. So to run my rabbitry weekly, looking at that, my bags of feed are about $25 after tax. So if we round up, it's costing me about $50 a week to feed all these monsters. And again, these are winter numbers, not summer numbers. Now, if we're looking at summer numbers, I'm just going to go cry in a corner because I can have about 100 rabbits at a time. So if we just use a quick conversion, uh, 20 rabbits is equivalent to $50. In the summer, if I'm having 100 rabbits, that's like $250 a week to feed everyone. Which sounds outrageous. I know that. But if we're breaking down my meat rabbits per pound and how much we get out of them for meat, we're running at most a dollar per pound for meat. But most of the time, it's like way, 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 way less. Especially if I'm heavily breeding my meat rabbits, we're getting closer to 50 to 75 cents a pound per meat. 
but that feed bill is also offset by the fact that I sell quail, which pays for most of my feed bills. And during the FFA season and the 4-H season, I sell rabbits to kind of upkeep with those costs as well. So those numbers sound outrageous, but don't let it scare you from starting in your rabbitry. The meat itself is worth it when you're comparing to buying supermarket meat. But there's a lot of ways you can also offset those costs. You can sell the manure, you can sell the pelts, you can make things out of the byproducts from the rabbit, you can build cages or nest boxes. I tattoo ears at show. Most of the time that'll pay for my show. So there is a lot you can do to kind of help with those costs. We have a real nasty cold front coming in, so I am redoing all the bedding here on the homestead and just prepping for that. I have about six inches of sawdust in here, and I gotta go to Tractor Supply. I'm gonna go pick up some straw and pack it full even more. This door actually closes into the coop, and normally I just allow it to stay open and they stay in the larger run of the coop. But starting tonight, just to make sure they're warm, I'm going to go ahead and shut this as well so that they stay nice and warm throughout the night. All of the rabbits are going to get what look like nesting boxes, which I'm just going to pack full of straw to give them a little insulation. Some of them are wood, some of them are cardboard, but I really need to start getting all this taken care of. Dallas the horse is getting two blankets. And then the windows behind the cages, I'm going to cover with cardboard, just so we can get a little more insulation in here. We're getting ready to drop down to negative 50 Wednesday into Thursday, so I want to be as prepared as possible. In theory, everyone should be fine, but I don't want to take any kind of risks. Let's talk about foraging. There is this absolutely magnificent book called Beyond the Pellet. It's a really great read with some really great information. There are a lot of pros and cons when it comes to foraging, but the biggest thing you want to look at is mitigating your risks in those options. When it comes to my breeders, they are so precious to me that I am very, very careful in what I feed them. I feed mostly pellet, and then I will add treats on top of that every once in a while. But the idea of something happening to my rabbits because I don't offer them a proper diet or I feed them the wrong thing is something that really worries me. Because I have the theory down. I understand nutrition. I understand feeding beyond the pellet. But I personally won't do it with my breeders unless it was a necessity. Like if the world went to hell in a handbasket, you bet I'd be foraging. But beyond that, I like the simplicity of pellets and how day in and day out it is on balanced nutrition. Because the biggest point other than bloat, GI stasis, diarrhea, that kind of thing that you have to worry about when it comes to foraging is balancing their diet. Making sure that they get enough protein to grow out appropriately. And I'm not saying that it can't be done, it can. But the question is, is how much time do you want to put into that project? I saw a post one time on a Facebook group that said, I feed each rabbit about a five gallon bucket worth of garden scraps a day, which is a lot of work for a rabbit. Now I, in the summer as a breeder, have more than one rabbit. I have close to a hundred rabbits. So the idea of 500 gallons worth of garden scraps a day to feed my herd is a little outrageous. And to be honest, it's just not effective for both time and cost efficiency. Now, we could argue on a split diet, meaning that you feed a certain percent pellet and a certain percent other things. And again, that's something that you might want to look into and might want to discover for yourself. And again, it's a great piece of knowledge to have in the back of your mind. I think about it a lot. But for now, I just stick to pellets. I like the pellet. I love the pellet. The pellet is simple and the pellet is nutritious. But again, if you're really interested, read the book Beyond the Pellet. Great source of information. This is Shadow. Shadow is a mini Rex out of Penguin and Strawberry at about 12 weeks old. And he's not horrible, he's just slightly off. And because of this, I have to be nitpicky because his father is so nicely proportioned. So this little buck has a very strong shoulder. 
up into a high point that is too far forward. Because this high point is forward, it is throwing off his loin, making it appear hollow before coming down to the rear in the table. I also don't like how flat he seems to be up towards that high point, which is also throwing out his height to depth ratio. I want that high point to be taller. When we flip him around to look at his rear, he is hollow in throughout that loin and is slightly pinched in that back end. Overall, I just want to see more flesh on him. And again, because strawberry is so nice, we won't be keeping this buck in our breeding program. One of the biggest pieces of advice that I can give you is to find a mentor in your area. Someone who has raised meat rabbits, have shown rabbits, someone who generally knows what they're doing to help you in your process. And the reason that I say locally is the hope is that when you do go to butcher your first round of rabbits, they can be there physically to help support you and get you through the first cull. Because having the emotional support of a mentor in person really does help with that kind of thing. I also suggest joining your breed club. So let's say you want to raise silver foxes, you'll want to join the silver fox club. Joining the ARBA is also super helpful, and you get some nifty little magazines that I absolutely adore. But that'll help connect you not only to other rabbit breeders within your breed, but it'll also help you network when it comes to shows and talking to people. And back on to the subject of mentors, I even have mentors. I ask a lot of questions. And I sit and I listen and I take what they say. I have this thing I call my toolbox, where I will sit and listen to the advice of anyone who's been doing this longer than I have, or people who have a different perspective than me. And I just store it away. Sometimes the advice is really useful and sometimes it isn't. But either way, I'm going to put it in my toolbox in case I need it later. Surrounding yourself with a bunch of people who are within the rabbit community can definitely help you fill that toolbox. And having a good mentor is priceless. Most other tips you can find on the interwebs, but that's one that a lot of people don't talk about. Yeah, I got you. We can give you a dog tour. This is Thor. He is my Swedish Volhound. He is about a year and a half old. He is my heart dog, and this is my heart breed. Um, I love this breed. And he's probably the most biddable dog I have ever had. He wants to please so much, and he is smart as heck. Like, uh, him picking up a trick just takes minutes. He picks up on things real quick. This turd right here is Balto. He is just under a year of age, and um, he dumb. He's very dumb. And not even a fun dumb, like a I run into walls at full force dumb. Um, he is a husky mix, but he is a very sweet boy. And if I could ever get him to understand how anything works, he would be amazing at like agility because he's so athletic, but he's really stupid. That is Panda. He is my 11-year-old doodle. I've had him since I was 15 years of age. And I hate doodles. Absolutely despise doodles. But he has just been the best dog. And because of him, I would really love to get a standard-sized poodle someday. But as far as free dogs go, he has been the best. We also have a female husky who is about two years old. Uh, she's actually at the bottom of the bed. Uh, she doesn't like me. That is my husband's dog. And when he isn't home, uh, that, that dog wants nothing to do with me. She is the most cunning animal I have ever met. She is super athletic and she's just a very special girl. But um, she's not my dog. These three boys, on the other hand, are definitely mine. But this is just kind of how we spend our evenings. At least until my husband gets home and then all three of the boys will be on the floor and Kiwi will be the only one in the bed. Let's talk about ear mites. Now, as a quick disclaimer, I already looked in this buck's ears. I'm not seeing anything, but obviously something's bothering him down in his ear because he's scratching a good bit and he's shaking his head. And I worry about ear mites because that can be a very serious problem and it's very hard to get control of in rabbitry. So I'm going to try natural first. I'm going to take a little bit of olive oil, put it down in the ears, rub it out. A lot of breeders like ivermectin or kitten uh, flea medication. 
I personally try to treat it as naturally as possible before we get into the medications that are a little stronger like ivermectin. But ivermectin is my favorite secondary point. So if we look down in this buck's ear, he does have some irritation and he has been scratching at it, as you can see. So again, I don't necessarily see very much when it comes to ear mites. Like I'm not seeing the dirt. I'm not seeing that kind of thing. I'm going to treat him anyway. And I'm just going to go down the line of my rabbits and see if anyone else has any irritation or anything and treat them as if they have it. Remember when it comes to your rabbits, they're very good at hiding things. So if you see even the smallest sign of discomfort or symptoms, jump on it. Also, just a friendly reminder, when it comes down to your monthly checks, toenail trivings, ears are another one of those things that you're going to want to check. Nothing worse than an ear mite infestation that gets out of hand, let me tell you. They can be some hard buggers to get rid of. There are a lot of factors that come to play if you are trying to breed litters for 4-H. Are they showing county? Are they showing state? What regulations do those have for the ages that they can put their animals in at? Are they showing juniors or seniors? Are they doing meat pens? What size do the animals have to be if they're doing meat pens? And then also the club rules. How long does this animal need to be in their care? At what age are they supposed to get it? Some 4-H'ers only do junior projects, while others do senior or meat. Some do doe projects. So find out those answers to those questions for your local area. However, I breed my babies in November for my first batch and will continue breeding them through February. That group and that batch of animals go towards 4-H and FFA for our local area. That also gives the kids a greater variety to choose from if they are doing a showmanship project versus a meat pen. But I have a lot of kids that do 4-H, but they're also ARBA members. So they may be looking for a 4-H project now, but they want a show prospect for the ARBA in six months. So there's a lot of questions when it comes to fulfilling the needs of 4-H projects. So when it comes to the wild rabbit population and people saying that you shouldn't eat wild rabbits, there are a few reasons that could come into mind, especially if we're talking about the seasons. Something can do with laws and regulations. Other times it can be about breeding cycles and when does naturally have their kits. And of course you want to check your state laws to verify when rabbit is in season or when you are allowed to hunt it and how many you are allowed to bag. But most of the time when I hear people talking about not eating wild rabbits or eating them past a certain season, it's about wild rabbit fever and hemorrhagic diseases. And the reason why they talk about waiting till the winter to eat those rabbits is that uh, during the winter, those cases are lowered and make it more safe to eat them wild. If you are worried about rabbit fever or any of those other problems, again, I would look at your state department and see what your local fish and wildlife says about hunting wild rabbits and if they advise against it in your area. I personally have never had an issue eating wild rabbit. And when we look at rabbit transmitted diseases to humans, they are very far and few between here in the United States. The silver fox babies are officially two weeks old which means we are looking for open eyes and all of that good stuff. But they are so spicy. I love it. And they are just doing really well. With that being said, uh, let me see here. My favorite is right here. I have to do by feel because they all look the same. This is the chunk of the litter. Look how big this baby is. I'm hoping that right there is a nice looking doe. And by the looks of it, everyone has clean faces. I'm not seeing any white, off white marks, which was a worry for this litter because of Vanessa. But if we don't have that white spot gene perpetuating down the line, I will be extremely happy because that was kind of the goal for this next generation with Vanessa, along with the longer hair type, was to see if we could keep a baby this time that didn't have white spots. So none of the baby has seemed to have that. Will that change as their hair grows out a little more? Maybe, but I don't see any stars. I don't see any stripes. So yeah, but these guys are so spicy and they did super well during this blizzard. So I'm very happy with that. 
So these black cages here are from Tractor Supply. They are do more cages. They are one of the cheapest options on the market and I really like them because they are collapsible and you can store them super easy. And if you want them to be a little more sturdy, all you have to do is just zip tie your corners and they are very stable. A few of the downsides to these is that the coating does come off and you have a couple of options. You can just let the coating go or you can recoat it. And sometimes it's really easy to accidentally pull the hinges and loosen the door. So you have to put the pliers onto it and repinch it. A bit annoying, but not that big of a deal. And also because of their color, they show dirt horribly. I can wipe these things down daily and the dust just sticks to them like mad. Compared to your normal metal cages, which are a gray color that hide dirt really well. My next option I have over here are my Pet Lodge cages. I like these from a standpoint of they're super sturdy and very long lasting. But just like any wire cages, they're very hard to take apart should you need to move them. This is a bit more expensive of an option, but it is a good option. And you can find local cage builders in your area that will make cages like this to your specifications. But something to keep in mind when you are looking at getting into rabbits other than cages is your setup. Waste management is a huge thing when it comes to raising rabbits and how easy you want to make it on yourself. So go through all the options for that. And then also look at your feed and watering systems. Automatic watering systems can be amazing if you can one, afford them, and two, if they are useful in the area in which you live. If you live in an area like me where it is freezing cold six months out of the year, it may not be the best of options. But whatever you look at, just do your research, you're going to do amazing. This is such a wonderful hobby to get into and it is so much fun. Let's talk about showing rabbits. The kind of showing I do at the ARBA, I take a rabbit, I put it in another cage, I drive it an hour or so down the road, for it to be put into another cage for somebody to look at to be put back into a cage to drive home. It's about the same if I'm breeding a doe. I put them in a travel cage to put them in the truck to drive around the block to come home. There's just a step or so missing. You're right in that rabbits are prey animals. But when we look at raising rabbits, we need to mitigate our stock, just like anyone would mitigate their stock for any other breed. I'm not going to keep a neurotic mess in my breeding program. So an animal who can't handle a car ride and somebody else touching them it doesn't belong in my program. Because if they're that stressed out by something so simple, that means they're going to be passing those genetics on to their kin. And stress isn't just a rabbit shaking in a corner. Stress is aggressive tendencies. It's aggressive action. It's teeth grinding. It's pacing that equates into weight loss. It's a lowered immune system, which equates to the rabbit getting sick more often. All things you don't want in your lines. It's not extremely stressful for a rabbit to go to show. There is a level of stress to it, just like pulling your animal out of a cage and putting them into a travel carrier to go somewhere else is. But it's important to prove your rabbits to make sure that you have good stock. I need a judge to look over these guys to make sure that I am breeding what I think I'm breeding so that I don't become barn blind. Not to mention, it's extremely fun. And to your last point of selfishness, understand that humans are inherently selfish. It's what comes with survival instinct and cognizant ability, packed on to the fact that we are at the top of the food chain. And with no real harm coming to the animals that we are showing, it's okay for us to be selfish and take our rabbits to show. Lord help me, I keep ending up on pet talk and the search bar above my head always seems to want to be like, look at pet rabbits. No thanks. No thanks, TikTok. I am good. But while we are here, uh, let's talk about studies. When it comes to the appropriate care and welfare of animals. Now, when it comes down to regulation, when we're looking at the agricultural department, although rabbits do fall under the class of poultry, they do all have their regulations that are based in species appropriate care. Meaning that what I have here is based completely and utterly on the agricultural department when it comes to good animal welfare. 
If I were to have a surprise inspection, I would pass on all levels. Although they probably ask me where my tray is right now because I am pulling trays and dumping them. But in less than a minute, I can be code appropriate. So when you do get people in here that are yelling about abuse and neglect, more than anything, it's just frustrating because they don't necessarily understand the implications from a farming perspective in that there is nothing wrong with these kind of setups. And in fact, when we do look at studies, they are appropriate. When we look at Ohio State University, Michigan State University, uh, Texas AMU, Maine State, Florida State, and some of the top agricultural colleges in the world even, when we look at free range versus open air system, this is considered an open air system, by the way, we not only see uh, best instances of carcass quality, including bottoms of the feet, mind you, but also looking at indicators biologically when it comes to cortisol levels, antioxidant levels, and other things that show up in the blood and fecal matter. And when we talk about biased studies being like, oh, we're just looking for the smallest cage size to fit the most rabbits possible, again, that is incorrect. From a standpoint of if we look at cortisol to cage size studies, we actually see a rise in cortisol, a rise in stress of these animals as we get larger into cage size. Especially when we're looking at common laboratory animals such as New Zealand whites and Californians, which are known for being more flighty than a lot of other breeds. It's very easy to induce stress on those animals given inappropriate environments, which is why we are so anal retentive of providing the best care. Then we talk about enrichment and enrichment studies, which finds when it comes to enrichment, you want less of this and more of this. Being a toy of enrichment that is destructible and easily replaced, compared to a toy like this, which is more common and doesn't provide stimulation. Plus, when looking at studies, we look at destructive toys equating to lower cortisol levels. But yeah, it's not abuse if you don't like it. Girl, you make my academic heart so happy with this comment. Because I have two points for this, because when I talk about I hyperfixate on rabbits, it's not just the basic stuff. Like the depths of which we can talk about rabbits as a whole, um, it really bothers my husband. Because I can literally take anything he's talking about and relay it to rabbits. So, there are two things I want to talk about. One being, we have recently found out that ancient Romans were raising rabbits in hutches. Which is a huge discovery when you go to look at the most recent um, idea of people raising rabbits for meat was taken back to French monks and European nobility. So the fact that we are now finding evidence that we have been domesticating rabbits now instead of for a couple of hundred years into the thousands of years and that it wasn't just nobility and monks but the common average everyday people is a huge leap. We're talking thousands of years of evolution of rabbits of the European population turning into domesticated rabbits. And it's just such a huge boon of information to just really dig into. So if y'all have time to look up the most recent research into ancient Romans raising rabbits, it's super interesting. There's not much on it yet because the discovery was made, I think, around 2018. Or at least that's when the paper was published. And I can't wait to see how this evidence correlates to how we see rabbits as a whole and how we can track certain breeds of rabbits as well as their purpose. And then the second thing that I want to talk about, I wrote a huge paper on it, because for one of my big statistical classes, uh, we had to just gather data as a whole and write a huge paper. And it correlates with how rabbits and other animals went from being seen as work or livestock animals to pets. And that is how the American dream directly correlates with the downfall of backyard farming. And we're talking about the farming of animals and personal gardens because it doesn't fit within the white picket fence narrative of the 40s and 50s. And as we see the common families moving to suburbia to kind of put into that white picket fence idea, a lot of at-home farming was neglected. People were so keen on to how things looked that they didn't want to raise animals in their backyard. So a lot of what people do in urban homesteadings is kind of like a lost art, at least in America, to that correlation. But because the idea of factory farming was booming, it allowed for more people to have access to foods. 
all meat, dairy, vegetables, making it more sustainable for people to live in suburban areas instead of raising their own animals. Pros and cons. But that's also where we saw a huge rise in the population of pets. Because pets are not a necessity, but a privilege.